this first. Okay, so we are going to get started with the cardiovascular system in just a moment. All right, so you should be able to see my screen uh, right about now. And one of the first things I wanna talk about is something that I've mentioned before, before we get into the cardiovascular system. I mentioned this before, and I wanna make sure that people are, are understanding this because this helps to explain a lot of things uh, in medicine, a lot of things that you're gonna run into. So, Inflammation. Is caused by two things. Injury. And infection. Now I do include allergic reactions under the category of injury. So inflammation is caused by these two things, injury and infection. So anytime cells die, the unexpected necrosis, unexpected cell death, anytime that occurs, there's gonna be uh, a response by the body that is going to try to fix things and stop things from getting worse. And we call that inflammation. You cannot see this, it's an M, inflammation. You cannot see this, but you can see some of the things that happen as a result. So the injured cells send out a message saying, help me, I'm dying. So we have particles, uh, proteins, and cells that come rushing to this area to try to help out. That is called inflammation. And the thing that follows inflammation is edema, swelling, fluid. All these particles rush into this area. This goes back to when we talk about osmosis. Osmosis is that passive movement of water across a selectively permeable membrane from an area of low solid concentration or high solid concentration. So because of all of these particles rushing into this area, we now have a lot of solutes, a lot of solid particles suspended in a liquid, which means, dang it, which means fluid is going to follow. And it is that fluid that is following, we call edema, swelling. Now, why is swelling bad? If you think of our bodies, you have to kind of imagine that we're somewhat vacuum packed so that there's not a whole lot of just empty space in between uh, tissues. And so anytime there's gonna be swelling, that means as fluids collecting in this area, there's going to be something getting compressed where we put in pressure on something and stretching something else if, it'll, if it's stretchable. So compression and pressure is bad because if we have blood vessels, the blood vessels could be getting compressed as a result of this collection of fluid, this swelling that is collecting in the tissues over here. If we put um, pressure on these small blood vessels, that's gonna stop blood flow from moving through. So blood that wants to go this way, now doesn't get through or barely gets through. That means 
more tissue, more cells that are waiting for nutrients like glucose, oxygen, and water aren't going to get what they need. That's going to cause more tissue death. More tissue death causes more inflammation. More inflammation causes more swelling. You can see how that would be bad. And of course, if this is blood vessels found in some place like the brain, now we got a big problem. Another thing that swelling can put pressure on are nerves, which means signals that are supposed to be traveling down the nerve. Remember those action potentials aren't going to get the chance to travel down the nerve or they're going to get interrupted or the nerve is going to send a signal back saying this is, uh, there is something interrupting our pathway and we want you to know about it. And that's what's going to cause pain. Or is this swelling is there and then is relieved and is there and then is relieved as blood flow goes, goes back to those uh, nerve cells. They send that tingling aching sensation. So anytime there's injury, cells are dying. They're going to send out this signal. Then there's going to be particles that will come rushing to this area, including cells. They're going to try and help out, fix the problem. And because we're going to have all these particles there, now we're going to have a movement of fluid. And of course, we call that osmosis. But that movement of fluid is going to create an area of swelling, the edema. That's going to cause pressure on tissues. That's going to cause pressure on nerves. That's going to cause pain, decreased blood flow more in some cases. So if we want to stop this, if we want to stop the edema, then we have to stop the inflammation. And the thing we use to stop inflammation corticosteroids. Corticosteroids stop inflammation. If you stop inflammation, you'll stop the swelling. If you stop the swelling, you'll stop all of those things that come along with it. And if you don't want to use a steroid, we'll use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs like naproxen and that will stop the inflammation which will then of course stop the swelling but for all practical purposes when you hear anywhere in the body that there is inflammation something is inflamed or if you just hear the ending itis Remember, itis means inflammation of. So if you hear any word that ends in itis, then you're going to start to think, well, then wait a minute. If there's an itis, then we need a corticosteroid to stop the itis. This is stuff that's going to really help you out in understanding uh, some of the concepts in medicine. So. FYI, anytime you hear corticosteroid, you know it's going to be treating inflammation. It's not going to be something to use to get rid of the pain, although it can get rid of the pain. It's not getting rid of the pain. It's not stopping the pain. It's stopping the things that lead up to the pain. It's not a pain blocker, if you will. So good things to know. Like I said, we talked about that before, but I definitely want you to have an understanding of that. Oops, that is totally out of proportion. I usually try to draw, draw the left side a little bit bigger and the right side a little bit smaller, but that didn't work out. Okay, here's our heart. Heart has four basic chambers to it. Two on the top, two on the bottom. 
two on the right side, two on the left side. And remember, it's always the patient's right or left. The aorta is the largest single artery in the body. The aorta, I put a circle around the L and the R. There we go. The aorta, the single largest artery in the body. And you see there are some branches that come off of it right as it comes up out of the heart. So we talked about what blood does. And we know that blood transports things. That's its job. There we go. This is the vena cava of inferior and superior. So I didn't draw enough room for that, did I? Hmm. So I'm, I'm not going to include the lungs of the, the vessels, for, well, include the vessels for the lungs, but not the lung nomenclature. Nope, I didn't finish capillaries, did I? Capillaries are the smallest blood vessels in the body. This is in the capillaries, that is where the oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange takes place. There's the pulmonary trunk taking blood over to the lungs. And then we have some pulmonary veins. bringing blood from the lungs to the heart. So we draw them typically in red and blue, red indicating the arteries and oxygenated blood because oxygenated blood is a bright red color. Capillary, uh, the, uh, sorry, the veins we draw in blue, although the uh, red blood cells that are in the veins are still red because of things like carbon dioxide. The blood takes on more of a purplish red, but it's still red. So for all those people who think that blood is blue until it hits oxygen, that's just not true. It is a purplish red in the veins, but we still draw the blood in the veins as blue. And the walls of the veins can be a blue color, in fact. And the vena cava comes into the right side of the heart from the top and from the bottom. Oh, no, I still need blue. So if we start by looking at the heart and we see that there are four chambers, two on the top and two on the bottom, and there are walls in between these chambers, Notice there's walls in between the two top chambers and there's walls between the two bottom chambers. A wall is known as a septum, written green just for fun. So here we have one wall between two bottom chambers. Here we have another wall between the two top chambers. So we have septa, because plural of septum is septa. And we have blood returning from the body that is low in oxygen. If blood is low in oxygen, then it must go to the lungs because that is where we get our oxygen. So blood going 
uh, to the lungs are going to pick up oxygen, and then it is going to get up to get pumped around the heart. Or pump, sorry, pumped around the body, which means it has to return to the heart, and they get pumped around the body. Yeah, it's a uh, one big circle. However, uh, again, if we need to get that blood to the lungs, we actually have to pump it to the lungs. And of course, the main pump in the body is the heart. So blood that is in need of oxygen is actually first going to go to the heart, specifically the right side of the heart. And it's going to enter that top right chamber called the right atrium. And that top right chamber is going to pump the blood downward into the bottom right chamber. That is the right ventricle. And then that right ventricle is going to fill up with blood. And it will pump the blood up and out. into the pulmonary trunk, which will go uh, split off and become the two main pulmonary arteries that will take blood to the lungs, through the lungs, as it branches off into smaller and smaller vessels, where that blood will pick up oxygen and release that unneeded carbon dioxide. Then the blood will return back to the heart but it will return to the left side of the heart. And you see way over in this left corner by the L, we have these pulmonary, oh dang it. We have these pulmonary veins, there we go, coming back to the left side of the heart, specifically that top left chamber. And of course, we're gonna have pulmonary veins coming from the right lung as well as the left lung. And that is going to fill up this top left chamber, that left atrium, which is going to collect that blood and pump it downward into the left ventricle. Then the left ventricle is going to fill up with blood and it will pump that blood up and out into the aorta, the largest artery in the body which will then split off into many other smaller arteries, which will branch off into smaller arteries, which will branch off into smaller arteries, which will branch off into the smallest arteries, the arterioles, which eventually will get all the way down to these capillaries. And now understand that this capillary level way down here, we can see we're going this direction. At this capillary level, way down here, these vessels are the smallest blood vessels in the body. In some cases, they're simply spaces in between cells. And they are so small that red blood cells have to move through single file and they have to be flexible as they have to squeeze through the capillaries. But what happens in the capillaries oxygen leaves the red blood cell and moves into the tissues moves into the cells because remember that's where we need it we need it in the cell we're going to need oxygen in order to make energy in order to make atp we're going to need glucose oxygen and water to get into the cells so the oxygen is going to get off the red blood cell bus in the capillaries remember they're going through single file and they're being squeezed through as they go through. And oxygen is going to get off the red blood cell bus. And it is going to move into uh, the cells in, the, in whatever area we happen to be in. Now, what's going to cause those cells to want to move from this area and from one area to another area? Well, 
First thing is there's going to be a conformational change of the hemoglobin molecule that's going to change and allow oxygen to get off the bus. But then there's another driving force called diffusion. Remember, if we have a lot of particles in one area and less particles in another, as long as they can fit across membranes, as long as they can move, they're going to move with their concentration gradient. Remember, they're going to move downhill, we say. So there's a lot more oxygen coming through those capillaries. There's a lot less in the cells and in the tissue. So oxygen is going to leave and move into those areas. At the same time, those capillaries are gonna pick up waste. Things like carbon dioxide, as a for instance. And that carbon dioxide is going to move into those areas in the capillaries. Now I know sometimes the books will say that carbon dioxide will take a seat on the bus and it will go ahead and take that seat that oxygen left empty. But that's not really accurate because so it makes it sound like it's a perfect one for one trade. It is true that red blood cells can carry uh, carbon dioxide as well. However, most of the carbon dioxide actually stays in the blood because it travels in a different form. When it's in the blood, it travels as bicarbonate, HCO3 minus, which is an incredibly important buffer to maintain our blood pH. So most carbon dioxide is going to travel as bicarbonate, HCO3 minus. And then that uh, blood is going to move through those capillaries. And those capillaries are going to form together to, to become the smallest veins in the body called venules. And those small venules will join together to become larger veins. And then larger veins become bigger veins and bigger ve veins become bigger veins. And eventually they become either the superior vena cava or the inferior vena cava, which is going to take that oxygen, try that again, take that blood that is low in oxygen and bring it right into that right atrium again. That right atrium is going to collect that blood and it's going to pump it straight down. It's going to go from the right side to the right side. It does not go from right to left, at least not in adults. It's going to go from the right side. It's going to go straight down to the right side. So it's going to go from the top right atrium to the bottom right ventricle. That right ventricle is going to collect that blood and it is going to, with great force, pump that blood up and out into the pulmonary trunk, which I've made here in purple way up here, which is going to send it eventually to the right and the left lungs. And as it goes through the lungs, it is going to pick up oxygen. It is going to release carbon dioxide. And again, those particles are going to move because of diffusion and also because of the conformational change of the hemoglobin molecule, but they're gonna move because of diffusion and more oxygen comes in, carbon dioxide leaves, the blood continues through the lungs, then it returns to the left atrium through these pulmonary veins I've drawn in orange way over here. It's gonna go into the left atrium. That left atrium is gonna fill up with blood and its job then is to do one thing, is to pump it straight down into the left ventricle that left ventricle is gonna collect that blood and with a great deal of force, it's gonna pump that blood up and out into the aorta. That blood getting pumped out is coming out. They're actually entering the aorta at just under 200 miles per hour, which means great volume of blood there's a lot of mass there in that blood. And at just under 200 miles per hour is a great deal of acceleration. And if you remember 
uh, some high school physics, force is equal to mass times acceleration. There's a lot of force coming out on, into that aorta, which means that tube, that aorta better be strong enough. And it is, it is a big tube and it is thick, full of muscle. The heart, as we will see, is the main pump in the body, but it is not the only pump. It is the main pump, but it is not the only thing that pumps blood around. And when we look at the muscle of the heart, we will see that the top chambers have very little muscle because all they really have to do is pump the blood straight down. The bottom chambers have really thick muscle. So these ventricles are going to be much thicker, especially that left ventricle. A lot of muscle here. And the reason for that is because they need a lot of force to push that blood around the body, to push that blood to and through the lungs. Now, the problem then of, that you might wonder is if the blood is being pumped from the top down to the bottom and then from the bottom out to the aorta or out to the pulmonary trunk, why doesn't the blood go backwards the way it came? Because there seems like there'd be less resistance perhaps that way. Well, there's a reason the blood doesn't go backwards. And that is because we have one-way valves in these different locations. And on the right side, between the right atrium and the right ventricle, we have this one-way valve called the tricuspid. It is the tricuspid because it has three cusps, these leaflets. And they allow blood to flow through, but then will snap close so that blood does not go backwards. And instead the blood is redirected up into the pulmonary trunks. Pulmonary trunk, excuse me. I don't mean to make that plural pulmonary trunk to the pulmonary arteries. That is called the pulmonary valve up here. And it's a little bit different. It's a semi-lunar valve. Works a little differently. On the left side, we have the bicuspid valve. It only has two cusps, the bicuspid also known as the mitral valve. And yeah, you definitely want to know both names because you'll hear, hear it referred to as both the mitral valve and the bicuspid. That's a strong valve, it needs to be. And then we have the aortic valve, which is another semi-lunar valve, just like the pulmonary trunk. And that's the aortic valve. Okay, so why do I make a big deal about some valves in the heart? Why is that so important? Well, the heart works very efficiently. So both the right top chamber, the right atrium, and the left top chamber, the left atrium, both of the atria fill up with blood at the same time. And then both of those chambers are gonna pump blood straight down at the same time. So both of those ventricles are going to fill up with blood at the same time. And both of those ventricles are going to pump blood up and out at the same time. So what's gonna happen is the valves that separate the top chambers from the bottom chambers are going to close at the same time. And the valves that are found at the pulmonary trunk and the aorta are going to close at the same time. And that closing of the valves is going to make a very familiar sound. When you think of that heart sound, that love dub sound, S1 and S2 heart sounds, 
most people think of that as the heart beating. But it's actually the sound of these valves closing. So the first sound you hear, that lub sound, that S1 sound, is actually the sound of the tricuspid and mitral valve closing simultaneously. And that second heart sound, that S2 or that dub sound, is the sound of the pulmonary valve and the aortic valve closing simultaneously. So you're not actually hearing the heart beat, you're actually hearing valves close that makes those heart sounds. Now why is that important to you or why do you care? Well, obviously there's pathology that can occur if those valves don't work properly. And one thing that you can hear if those valves, for instance, aren't closing properly, they can cause what we call a murmur. So you'll hear the regular heart sounds, but you'll also hear an additional sound. Oops, one went too late on that one. Or you can hear a These additional heart sounds can be are the result of blood moving backwards through a valve that hasn't closed completely. So if you know which valves are closing when, and that S1, S2 sound, the S1 is both the tricuspid and the bicuspid or micro valve, <coughs> closing simultaneously. And the S2 are the pulmonary uh, and the aortic valves closing simultaneously. If you know that, when you hear the murmur, it gives you some information. If you hear the murmur after the S1 sound, well, then that's going to be the tricuspid or the bicuspid valves that aren't closing completely. If it's after the S2, then you know it's the pulmonary uh, valve or the aortic valve that's not closing simultaneously. So you at least get that information real fast just from when you hear the heart sound. Now, a heart murmur might indicate some severe pathology or it might be clinically insignificant. And some of you have probably had a child or maybe you were a child and the pediatrician told you or told your parents when uh, you were born or when the child was born that they heard a murmur and the parents gasped and the pediatrician would say something like well we'll just keep an eye on it they'll probably grow out of it actually meaning they'll probably grow into it because of course a child is still growing not just getting taller and needing bigger shoes but also their parts are growing into position so everything might not have grown into position yet or completed yet. So that's why when that pediatrician hears a murmur in that new baby, they will often say things like, well, we'll just keep an eye on it. They'll probably grow out of it, which is good. So basic overview of the heart. We're gonna hear uh, some of these things over again, but that's sort of my take on it. Good stuff to know, as we will see coming up. Chapter 17. Cardiovascular system, a circulatory system. This is a circular system, meaning it's continuous. If you start in one place, you're going to end up back there.
That's it. <laughs> That's it. So let's look at where the heart is located. Okay, so very basic. We know that the heart is located in the thoracic cavity. The thoracic cavity is bordered anteriorly, anteriorly by the bones of the sternum. Thoracic cavity is bordered laterally by the ribs, posteriorly by the vertebrae, and of course, inferiorly, the uh, thoracic cavity is bordered by that muscular diaphragm. And inside the thoracic cavity, what takes up most of the space are the lungs, but right in that central area, although it is kicked over to the left a bit, remember it's always the patient's left, we find the heart. Now, there's different ways that people will try to compare the size of the heart. Uh, most people say it's about the size of your fist. Some people say, well, it's sort of the size of your two hands clasped together. Um, chances are it's somewhere right in between there on average. And if you look at this heart right here, you think, well, that doesn't look anything like the drawing that we just went over. Um, well, it doesn't look that different either, if you think about it. You can't really make out where the right atrium is, for instance, uh, even on a cut section of the heart, uh, or even in a heart that has been removed for um, dissection or prosection. When you look at the heart, the atria kind of deflate. So they kind of look like deflated balloons almost that are flopped over this tissue. And there's gonna be a lot of fat on the heart. You're gonna find a lot of fatty tissue. So it doesn't always look exactly like you see in these textbooks, but gives you a good idea of what to expect. You can see the superior vena cava, sorry, the superior vena cava coming into the right atrium. I don't know if you can see the inferior, you cannot. Uh, you can see the aorta as it comes up and arches over. And it has those three branches that come off, the brachiocephalic, and then the uh, left common carotid, and then the left subclavian. Uh, we will go over those in a little more detail later. And then it arches over and goes downward. You can see the pulmonary trunk, which would have been what I drew in purple coming from the right ventricle, and you can see how it branches off and goes over to the left lung with those branches and to the right lung with those little purplish branches there. And you can see these red vessels that are all gonna come back to that left atrium. Those are the pulmonary veins, although it doesn't look like they're marked here. Uh, something that I definitely want people to remember uh, because this is incredibly important. And I don't know if they're named on here, but we will go over these. If you look at this heart as it's sitting here, you can see there are blood vessels running down the heart this way. These are the coronary arteries. Remember, corona means crown. So somebody thought when they looked at these vessels that they sat on the heart like a crown. So the coronary arteries are of great importance because these are the arteries that actually deliver blood and therefore nutrients to the heart muscle themselves. Even though there's a lot of oxygenated blood in the heart, especially in the left side of the heart, the heart can't really use it. Most of that oxygenated blood cannot be used by the heart. A small amount of oxygen will diffuse across in the inner membrane and the inner uh, lining and the, yeah, the inner membranes. But the rest of that muscle really needs blood supply to come down. And you can see, and there's one in red and one in blue, there's a coronary artery and a coronary vein. So the artery is bringing the blood uh, down to the heart muscle. And then the coronary vein is going to collect um, the waste products and return that blood 
eventually back into the right atrium. I'm gonna go over this again, but I want you to hear this. The reason those coronary arteries are important to know about is because this is where heart attacks occur. When people have a heart attack and people die from heart attacks, when that occurs, it occurs in these arteries here because for some reason, blood flow has stopped moving through those coronary arteries. And that's going to cause that area of the heart tissue to die, which is why we call it a myocardial infarction. Remember an infarction as a condition where there is an area of dead tissue and myocardial is pertaining to the muscle of the heart. So myocardial infarction is a condition with dead tissue pertaining to the muscle of the heart. That's bad because all of these heart cells, which are specialized branch heart cells, have to be able to contract and do it together and forcefully to pump that blood out of those ventricles and around the body. And if those cells die, well, then there's definitely a problem as the myocardial infarction. Okay, what did I, I said, I think I said, well, I said that it lies behind the bones of the sternum in the thoracic cavity. Remember that area is called the mediastinum. And hopefully uh, the adult shape and size won't change much. Although as we do get older, it has to tend to work harder. And because of its muscle, if it's working harder, then we can expect that there's going to be some sort of hypertrophy. And that's kind of what happens. We don't want the heart to get larger. It's a bit counterintuitive because if you're someone who works out regularly and lifts weights or does some sort of um, resistance training where you're building muscle mass, you think, well, it's better to have strong muscles because stronger muscles are, are going to help protect me in many ways, protect me from injuries in many ways, for instance. Uh, the one thing about the heart, however, most of the time, uh, when the heart gets enlarged, it enlarges in a bad way and it becomes less effective. So we really don't want that to happen. So enlargement of the heart is a bad thing most of the time. All right. Now consider this heart that we just talked about with, with these chambers, They're filling up with blood contracting, filling up with blood contracting, filling up with blood contracting. And there, the whole heart is inside of the space between the two lungs. You got to think, isn't that going to rub up against stuff? And if it rubs up against stuff, isn't that going to create friction? And one thing the body does not like is friction. So what the body does is it creates an area to decrease the friction. There is a double layer membrane around the heart called the pericardium. And there's really two basic parts to it. There is a layer that is in contact with the heart. That one I will refer to as the visceral pericardium. And then there is an outer layer. That one I refer to as the parietal pericardium. And here they call them parietal layer and visceral layer. I call them the parietal pericardium and the visceral pericardium. And I stick with those terms because we'll see in other chapters that there'll be similar linings around organs and they stick with parietal and visceral. So I'm going to stick with that here to make it easy. So this double layer membrane around the heart, one layer is in contact with the heart. That is the visceral pericardium, where peri means around. And then there is an outer layer, the parietal pericardium. And there's a small space, it's more of a potential space in between these two layers where we find fluid, a lubricating fluid called 
pericardial fluid. So now, instead of the heart rubbing up against things, we have these linings which can glide across one another, especially with that fluid right there. So you don't have that friction. It is an important concept because uh, there'll be other organs in the body that also have uh, this double layer membrane you'll hear them talk about. So it's a good thing to know, good thing to kind of start to understand. And then if you look here, where is I saw it? Ah, oh, there it is. So what you're looking at in this picture is a big chunk of heart muscle. And you can see myocardium right there. That is that wall of the heart. And then there's an inner lining, the endocardium. This inner membrane, this inner lining is important because it decreases friction also, allows blood to flow smoothly across the inner surface. Kind of the same reason we put Teflon on pans so that it becomes a non-stick surface. So now blood can flow smoothly across the surface without sticking. I'm not gonna worry about the trabeculae right now. Uh, we'll talk about that maybe in just a little bit. But the endocardium is important. And the reason it is important is because it worked out so well, the body said we should continue with this going into the blood vessels. And that's exactly what it did. But of course, in the blood vessels, we're not gonna call it endocardium because cardi means heart. Now in the blood vessels, we're gonna call it endothelium. Uh, or sometimes you'll hear me use the term intima, which is an older term, but it is one that is, uh, I've been, that I learned a long time ago and it just sort of stuck. So you might hear me refer to that inner lining of the blood vessel membrane as the intima, but it is the endothelium. Good stuff to know. Okay. Again, I prefer the term visceral pericardium rather than using the term epicardium. Uh, and that just is for continuity. So when we see in other chapters, there's a lining around the lungs, for instance, a double layer membrane. And the inner membrane is called visceral and the outer is called parietal. So I just try to maintain that and use that same terminology. Most of the heart is made up of myocardium. What does myo mean? Muscle. Cardi heart and the um is indicating this is a noun. So the myocardium is the tissue itself. And most of that tissue, no, yeah, most of that tissue is going to be made up of specialized branched cells that are going to be able to communicate around one another very, very quickly. And I just talked about the endocardium. Myocardium, that is the, that's what most of the heart is made of, big muscle. Although it does act like two separate pumps that just happen to be right next to each other. We'll see. All right, four cavities, four chambers of the heart. There's two upper chambers, a right atrium and a left atrium. The plural for atrium is atria. So there are two atria, two upper chambers, right atrium and left atrium. And there is a wall in between, a septum in between, the interatrial septum. True in both, there are veins that bring the blood to these chambers because all veins bring blood to the heart. That's kind of the rule. And as I said before, very thin walled. Unfortunately, I mean, they show a good picture over here, but it's not completely clear. Uh, but you can see, for instance, 
the right atrium here, which is going to pump blood straight down into the right ventricle, right ventricle. And the chordae tendineae, chordae tendineae, look like little heart strings. So when someone says they're tugging on your heart strings, there's something that resemble little strings. These actually attach to those valves. In this case, it's the tricuspid. And when that ventricle contracts, those papillary muscles are gonna pull and that's going to cause that valve to close and keep it closed. So you're actually seeing the tricuspid valve here. It just looks a little different in white. So blood moves from that top right chamber, the right atrium, gets pumped through that tricuspid and fills up that right ventricle. And you can see how thick the muscular wall they've drawn here in that right ventricle is. And here's the wall in between the right and left ventricle. Then it is going to, that right ventricle, let me clarify, is going to contract and pump that blood up and out into the pulmonary trunk, which you cannot see here. And it is going to send that blood over to the lungs. As it blood goes through the lungs, picks up oxygen, gets rid of carbon dioxide, it then returns through the pulmonary veins. So if we follow that, the pulmonary veins are, uh, you see two of them here, there'll be two coming from the other side that bring the blood into this chamber here, which is the left atrium. That left atrium is gonna collect the blood. You can see how thin the wall is, the left atrium. And it's gonna pump the blood through that bicuspid valve, which is right here. And you see the chordae tendineae of those into this lower chamber. That is the left ventricle. There it is, left ventricle. The left ventricle is then gonna fill up with blood and it is gonna pump that blood up and out at just under 200 miles per hour into the aorta, the largest, strongest artery in the body. And you can see it's gonna go right through this semilunar valve, the aortic valve right here. Now, that valve does not have this, the same sort of chordae tendineae because this is gonna rely on the blood moving backwards to collect and, and those depressions and cause that valve to close. That's the blood flow through the heart. Ventricles are the very, very large and thick muscled chambers on the bottom, separated by a wall, the interventricular septum. They're gonna get the blood from the chambers above them. And they have to have thick muscular walls to pump the blood up and out. As I said, we want the blood going in one direction. I think mean, this is actually a better way to kind of see the heart here. We want that blood going in one direction. We do not want the blood going backwards. Now, again, drawing the uh, veins, and in this case, the pulmonary trunk in blue, indicating low oxygen versus the drawing in red of the aorta and things on the left side indicating higher oxygen levels, uh, but blood is still red. So blood coming from the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava is low in oxygen, so it needs to get oxygen. That all, all going to collect into the right atrium. The right atrium is gonna contract, pump that blood straight down through that tricuspid valve and into the right ventricle. The right ventricle will collect all that blood, then pump it up 
and through that semilunar valve, you can see that happening here, which as that ventricle contracts, uh, both ventricles are contracting simultaneously, but you can see the blood moving from that right ventricle up into the pulmonary trunk, and then it is going to split off and go to the left lung and the right lung. Blood is then going to return into that left atrium via these pulmonary veins. That left atrium is gonna fill up with blood, gonna pump blood straight down through that bicuspid, also known as mitral valve. And then you can see that left ventricle is gonna pump blood up and it's gonna go behind this pulmonary trunk in this case. And it's gonna go through the aortic valve, this type of semilunar valve. So that blood is gonna get pumped out of that left ventricle at just under 200 miles per hour up into the aorta and then out throughout the rest of the body. Notice how both of the top chambers, the right and left atrium contract at the same time. And both of the bottom chambers, the right and left ventricle contract at the same time. And this is demonstrating what those valves would look like if they are open or closed. Uh, this is a good picture because you can see the tricuspid has the three cusps and the bicuspid has just the two. And the semilunar valves in this picture are open. And you can't really tell as much from this uh, image, but there are depressions in each of these areas in the semilunar valve that is going to collect the blood as it tries to go backwards and that is going to force it to shut. So, I think I talked about all of that. What this is showing is the direction of the muscle, uh, layers of the muscle in the heart as it's going to contract and help pump the blood up and out of the body. Because we, we really wanna squeeze those ventricles from the bottom up and we want the blood to get pumped in a directional way. We want it to go um, like squeezing toothpaste out of a tube. You start from the, the back and the bottom, the back, no, the bottom of it. And you squeeze upwards, you wanna force it through that small opening. So for instance, the ventricles, uh, they start their contraction way at their bottom, at the tip of the ventricles. And then this wave-like contraction occurs that pushes the blood into what you'll hear me refer to over and over as a unidirectional flow into this tube, the aorta, that goes out throughout the rest of the body. I talked about the semilunar valves. Um, I don't go much in the skeletal system of the heart, although there is sort of a rudimentary scaffolding, I would, I would call it, uh, that everything has to sort of attach to. That, that's probably a better way to describe it. Okay. So incredibly important. You can see the aorta. The aorta is always easy to spot. Starting from the left ventricle, that aorta goes upwards. Notice here, starts at the left ventricle. The aorta is going into an upward direction. Why is it going upward? Well, remember, all that blood that is in that aorta is fresh blood. In other words, it has a whole bunch of new oxygen. It is full of oxygen. And our cells need that oxygen along with glucose and some water. So what organ is going to need it more than any other? Which is the most important organ? The brain. So the aorta, now with all this freshly oxygenated blood, is going to pump the blood in an upward direction first because we want blood to go up to the brain, which is why you see these three branches here. And then of course you can see an arch over. What you cannot see way down here at the base of the aorta are the 
coronary arteries. And you'll notice there's two of them, a right coronary, left coronary artery. If you look here, you think, but it looks like there's more than two. Well, as this left coronary artery begins, it quickly branches off here. And you see part of it goes around to the back, becoming the circumflex artery. And then part of it goes straight down, becoming the anterior interventricular artery, still a coronary artery. And you can see the smaller branches off of those. Uh, but as blood pumps up through that aorta, at just under 200 miles per hour, it pushes those valves open. That's that semilunar valve. It pushes that valve open and blood goes rushing right past those coronary arteries. So even though those coronary arteries are technically the first branches off of the aorta, they do not get blood first because blood comes shooting out at just under 200 miles per hour and it's gonna shoot right past those openings. But as the um, ventricle relaxes and the blood in the aorta starts to lose that pressure and begins to move backwards, it is going to fill up those little slots here in the valve, those depressions, that is going to cause those valves to close. And now blood is going to have the opportunity to move down, as you can see here, into the right and left coronary arteries. So even though those coronary arteries, which are incredibly important, um, are the first branches off of the aorta, they're actually get the blood last. I mean, not last completely, but they have to wait for blood to sort of go backwards. So there's two main coronary arteries and the left one splits off becoming a circumflex artery. And then the anterior interventric interventricular artery. That one is an important one because when that one gets blocked, then blood cannot continue to travel down and deliver oxygen and nutrients to all this tissue here and that uh, right along the, the left uh, ventricle at the wall there. When that happens, when that, bl that blockage occurs there, more like, especially up around this area, that's what's often referred to as the widow maker. Because when that happens, that's a, that could be a disastrous heart attack about to happen blockage of the anterior interventricular artery. FYI. Questions? So how do we not, no, how do we keep from getting a blockage in those arteries? Because it sounds like a bad thing, it kind of is. What can we do to stop, decrease the likelihood of getting a blockage in those arteries? You're not gonna like the answers. because it's pretty simple if you're listening. Eat better. Eat healthy, and what else? What always goes along with eat healthy? 
exercise. Exercise. That's it. Eat healthy and exercise. Those are the biggest things you could do to keep from the keep this from happening. Um, two of the biggest things you could do. Uh, and you know, we could say just in general, a healthy lifestyle, because that includes things like, you know, limiting alcoholic beverages and not smoking and um, making sure that if a person is creating too much cholesterol, that they keep that under control, maintaining lower blood pressure, all that stuff, you know, minimizing salt, all those things. So yeah, healthy lifestyle is the one thing that is going to help decrease the chances of that occurring. I uh, know people hate to hear that. So any questions about any of this so far? Well, like I said, I do not expect anyone to understand this the first time they hear it or see it, or the second time they hear it or see it. Uh, if you do, that's awesome. I know I didn't. Uh, it took me about a thousand times of seeing this and hearing this and reading about this till it started to make sense to me. So. Uh, I, I expect that most people will probably have to have, you know, more than one time to hear and see and read this. So please make sure you take the time to see and hear and read this. The good news is that I will be uploading this onto YouTube. Uh, so you can see it there later on, hear it there later on. But you also do want to read about it. Uh, and don't forget, if you go onto YouTube to remember to like, subscribe, leave a comment below and visit the merch store below. Okay. Um, I am going to uh, take a bit of a break. So this is one of the reasons why we test people for high cholesterol. Um, we're going to test them because we know that if they have high cholesterol, some of their cholesterol is going to build up in that area, in these areas, in the, ar in the arteries, which is going to create these plaques. And remember, anytime there is any sort of uh, damage to that endothelium, that lining of the blood vessel, platelets will stick to it and then they'll stick to each other so uh, they can make the clot just bigger and bigger and bigger and fortunately that's what creates those occlusions those blockages and decreases blood flow through so we don't want that to happen so we test for cholesterol remember we need cholesterol uh, however, some people make too much cholesterol. I know a lot of people think, oh, they must be eating a high cholesterol diet. Actually, <clears throat> excuse me, very little of our total cholesterol comes from our diet. So when people have high cholesterol, it's not because they're eating too much cholesterol. It's simply because their body's making too much cholesterol, which is why those medications that are given, those statin drugs work so well because they inhibit the production of uh, cholesterol. They inhibit the, the, the making of it. They don't stop the body from bringing in more. Uh, they just stop the body from making more. Now we will say, you know, limit your fats because that'll help reduce the amount of cholesterol that's being made as well. And we'll say increase your fiber because if people have high cholesterol, increasing their fiber can help get rid of some excess cholesterol. And of course, that's why Cheerio says, eat a bowl of Cheerios a day for 30 days to lower your cholesterol. Well, it's only true if, um, if you have high cholesterol. If your cholesterol is low or normal, then normal range is probably not gonna lower it much at all. And uh, Cheerios is a high source, good source of fiber. So that's why they say that. That's why they can claim that. Because in that, those cases, it does, does help. But I digress. Okay. So I want to just remind everyone of someone else. Because I like doing that, you know. Because when we talk about blood and blood getting pumped around, we have to keep something in mind. We have to keep in mind the fact that if we have lower volume,
like in this water balloon, we have low pressure. If we have high volume, we have high pressure. So we'll put some water in there, of course. The water's trying to find its way out of that balloon. So it's going to press and press until it finds the weakest area. So low volume equals low pressure, high volume equals high pressure. This is one of the things that uh, can alter pressure, of course, in the body. So if we were to add solid particles, Let's say, here's our blood vessel. If we were to add solid particles like salt into the blood, water is going to move into the blood, which is going to increase the blood volume. And if we increase blood volume, we increase blood pressure. Uh, we have to maintain a certain amount of pressure to make sure that blood is pumping everywhere it needs to go, but we don't want it to be too high because then we start causing damage to other organs. And you might recall, I said before, in the endocrine system, aldosterone is a hormone from the um, adrenal glands, specifically the cortex of the adrenal glands, specifically the zona glomerulosa, the outer layer. Yes. And what aldosterone does is aldosterone helps to maintain a certain amount of salt in the blood. And if you bring salt into the blood, you bring water into the blood. And if you bring water into the blood, then you increase blood volume. If you increase blood volume, you increase blood pressure because water follows salt. And when we say salt, we mean solid particles. We don't necessarily mean sodium chloride or table salt. We just mean in general solid particles. And what's the other thing? That determines um, blood pressure. Resistance. So what does resistance mean? Well, Big blood vessel, less resistance. Small blood vessel, more resistance. Just like when you take your thumb, <laughs> said Gardner, you have a green thumb. Just like when you take your thumb and you put it over, oops, over a garden hose. This is a green thumb. When you take your thumb and you put it over a garden hose, what did you do? You took that larger opening and you made it smaller. So we'll do it in orange. So now, instead of having that big opening, now we have a smaller opening. The same amount of fluids coming through, but it's coming out of a smaller opening. What that's going to do is that is going to increase resistance and therefore increase pressure, which is why now you can shoot that water at your friend who's standing further away because you've changed the diameter, you've changed the opening of the garden hose. So our blood vessels can act the same way. We can, um, well, we do make them the openings larger and smaller in different, different ways, but the muscle that's inside of the wall is gonna contract. And of course, we're also gonna see this happening simply as 
blood vessels go from larger to branching off into smaller. We're going to expect that if it branches off into smaller, it's going to increase the uh, pressure in, in the individual arteries to some extent. But the two things, remember the two things uh, that alter blood pressure or maintain blood pressure as necessary is volume and resistance. Volume is just how much there is and resistance is of course going to be what force the blood has to push against. So you'll hear me talk about these things a few more times as we go through this. All right, let's pick up where we left off then. Do you think I'm, oops, let me make sure I'm recording. Yeah, I am, okay. And everyone is here, okay. All right, so let me switch back over again and we'll go back into some slides and see some more stuff. And then we'll come back and look at some of the anatomy of the heart here. I stress the coronary arteries so much because heart attacks affect people that we know, right? Um, someone that we know is going to die from a heart attack or at least have a heart attack. And it's, a, it's something that I think every medical professional should at least be able to understand what is happening. So those, those small little arteries that are sitting on top of the heart that are bringing blood to the heart muscle itself, all those arteries have to maintain a, a nice uh, flow to make sure all these areas of the heart are getting the nutrients they need. And even though these are the first two branches off of that aorta, you see they're kind of hidden down in here. Even though they're the first two branches that come off of that aorta, blood comes out of that left ventricle and into that aorta at just under 200 miles per hour. And it just pushes right past those valves. And then the blood, of course, just shoots right past those, the openings of those arteries. And it's not until the ventricle relaxes and the blood starts to move backwards, it closes those valves. And then that allows blood to move down into those. Uh, coronary arteries. So kind of scary to think about. Well, once those arteries drop off all the nutrients, they're going to pick up things like carbon dioxide and other waste products as well. And they are going to have to <clears throat> return all of that to the right atrium. So they have their own special unique opening. Whereas we looked at the uh, other picture that had the superior vena cava coming into the right atrium and the inferior vena cava, which is not on here, which is responsible for bringing blood back from everywhere else in the body. The superior, vena cava, the superior and inferior vena cava blood from everywhere else in the body flows into one of those large veins which goes into the right atrium. The only difference is with these coronary veins because of course we're going to have to pick up those waste products uh, as that blood goes through the coronary arteries and branch off into smaller arteries, branch off the capillaries. It's going to drop off the oxygen. It's going to pick up the waste products. So that blood carrying those waste products has to go back to that right atrium. So it does this in a connection called the coronary sinus. So this is uh, specific just for the heart. Everywhere else in the body, all that blood goes back to the heart, either through the superior vena cava or the inferior vena cava into the right atrium. The heart itself has its own unique little system that is going to take that blood and bring it back into the right atrium, collecting it and moving it into the uh, coronary sinus. A little different that way. Not surprisingly, 
<clears throat> there are sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers that innervate the heart. Because remember, uh, we live most of our life in the parasympathetic division of the uh, autonomic peripheral nervous system, doing things automatically. Unless we're being suddenly being chased by a bear, then we have to switch over to the sympathetic division, which is going to alter things like heart rate, for instance. So that should come as no surprise. Oops. Okay. Dang it. There we go. Let's talk about some of these blood vessels. And let's start with arteries. All arteries carry blood away from the heart. That's the rule. All arteries carry blood away from the heart. <clears throat> I say that's a rule because if we suddenly discovered a new alien species and this alien species died and we were dissecting this alien species and we found the alien species heart, any tube that carried blood <clears throat> away from the alien species heart, we have to call it an artery. So that's the rule. Any tube that carries blood away from the heart is an artery. So if it's a tube carrying blood to my foot, we got to call it an artery because it's going away from the heart. If it's a tube carrying blood to my stomach, then we have to call it an artery. If it's a tube carrying blood to the brain, we have to call it an artery. If it's a tube carrying blood to your thumb, we have to call it an artery. That's the rule. Any blood vessel carrying blood away from the heart is an artery. And arteries are specific. <clears throat> you cannot interrupt where they go. If you interrupt an artery, some part of the body, some organ, some tissue, some cells, are not going to get blood, they're not going to get nutrients and they will die. So I liken that to the waitress in the restaurant. She has to take the food from the kitchen and go to a specific table and give the food to a specific person at that table. And if something interrupts her and she's not able to do that, then that customer dies. Well, that might be a little dramatic, but you get the idea. If it's interrupted in some way, if blood cannot continue through an artery for some reason, then some organ, some tissue, some cells are not going to get the nutrients they need, and that's going to be followed by cell death. And arteries are specific that way. You cannot interrupt them. Arteries are under high pressure. And they are under high pressure because, well, they're both elastic and muscular. Arteries have a lot of muscle in their walls. So when blood comes through the artery, it has to have the ability to stretch and then contract to pump the blood forward in a unidirectional flow, in a one-way flow. That is important. It's important that the arteries can do that. And when you are taking someone's pulse, what you are feeling is you are feeling blood coming through that artery. And as it expands, you can feel that. And then it contracts to push that blood forward. Now that must mean there's two layers of muscle that is in that wall of that blood vessel. One in a circular layer, one in a longitudinal layer. It has to act like that because if it had just one direction, it would just contract and it would push blood in either way. So instead it has these layers that allows the blood to get pushed in one direction. So as blood comes through that artery and the artery expands and then it contracts, 
pushing blood in that one direction, that it's very important that they have the ability to do both. Because if they lose that ability, then blood pressure goes down. In other words, the heart is the main pump in the body. However, it is not the only pump in the body, or at least it's not the only thing that pumps blood. The arteries assist a lot in pumping blood through the body in the ability to be elastic and expand and the ability to contract and push the blood forward. And if the arteries lose that ability, then the heart has to make up the difference. And if the heart has to make up the difference, <clears throat> it has to work harder. And if the heart works harder because it's a muscle, it's going to enlarge. And as I said previously, and I will continue to say, enlargement of the heart is typically not a good thing because as it enlarges, it becomes less effective. So over time, it'll become less and less effective and will eventually just fail. And heart failure is the number one cause of death in America. Heart failure is the number one cause of death in Canada. Heart failure is the number one cause of death in England. Heart failure is the number one cause of death in China. Heart failure is the number one cause of death in Brazil. Heart failure is the number one cause of death in Australia. Heart fail. I just say it this way. Heart failure is the number one cause of death in the world. So this is one of those things that can lead up to that. If that heart has to work too hard because the arteries are not allowing that elasticity and that muscular contraction to move forward, then the heart enlarges, then it becomes less effective, then the heart starts to fail. I bring this up and I, I include this so much because you're gonna hear about arteriosclerosis, atherosclerosis, or just hardening of the arteries. If you haven't already heard about hardening of the arteries, you will. You'll hear a lot about hardening of the arteries. And because of that, it ultimately leads to heart enlargement and heart failure. So it's an important thing to think to uh, remember that arteries have to be elastic and they have to be able to pump that blood forward to keep to maintain that blood pressure and blood flow as we need it. So what happens if we cut an artery in half? Because it's elastic and muscular, if we cut that artery in half, it will spring apart. This is why when a person is maybe stabbed in the leg, and they have blood pumping out of their leg, not just leaking out, but it's like shooting out of their leg. That tells us, well, this has hit a major artery. So what we wanna do is we wanna put a tourniquet above that. And we wanna put a tourniquet several inches above that because if that artery has sprung apart, where we're putting pressure to stop the blood from pumping out might actually be below where the artery now exists, meaning um, the artery might have, might have sprung apart and you're putting pressure in the wrong place. So we wanna put the tourniquet several inches above it to make sure that we're actually stopping the blood flowing out of the artery. Arteries, because of this, are going to be found deeper in the body. This is a protective mechanism. The body says, well, since these things are under pressure, we don't want them to get cut or nicked or poked or punctured. So we're gonna to try to keep them as deep as we can. Now, a few places in the body where they 
are closer to the surface, we utilize those to take a pulse. Like that radial artery, and you know that's called the radial artery because it runs along the radius. Those carotid arteries that run up uh, the neck to the head, and those are, we'll see, are very important. Obviously, if it's taking blood to the head, it's important. That brachial artery that we uh, you utilize when we're taking blood pressure, for instance. The femoral artery, uh, one go, it's called the femoral artery because it follows the femur. Dorsalis pedis on top of the foot. And you'll probably never guess where the popliteal artery would be found. Well, yes, you would, because you know that popliteal means behind the knee. So the popliteal artery is going to be behind the knee. But again, and we'll see this as we look at some of these other ones. Um, if you know some of the names of the bones in the body, well, then knowing some of the names of the arteries is much, much easier. Uh, the arteries branch off into the smallest arteries called arterioles. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about the metarterioles, but I do kind of want you to see this here. You can see how the arteriole is going to eventually branch off into the tiniest blood vessels, the capillaries. And the capillaries are where we have um, the oxygen carbon dioxide exchange take, taking place. A sphincter is a muscular doorway. So that is going to help as those are relaxed or contracted, that's going to help determine where blood is going to flow, which uh, arterioles it will, or which capillaries will allow blood to flow into. And you can see how the uh, capillary, capillaries then sort of join back together and merge into the smallest of the veins called the venule. So the smallest arteries are called the arterioles. They're not the smallest vessels. The smallest vessels are the capillaries. And then the smallest veins are called venules, which will then come together as small veins, which will then come together as larger veins, which will eventually become the inferior or superior vena cava. Good stuff to know about. Okay. Again, capillaries are the smallest blood vessels in the body. In some cases, they are just spaces between cells and red blood cells have to move through them a single file. So we know that red blood cells are microscopic. We know we can't see a red blood cell, a single red blood cell without putting it under a microscope and turning it up under a higher power, which means the capillaries are going to be no bigger than a red blood cell. So that means they must too be microscopic. And of course they are. And I think that's what I want you to know about capillaries. This is where the exchange of nutrients takes place. So what about veins? Well, veins bring blood to the heart. All veins carry blood to the heart. That's the rule. So any blood vessel that is taking blood to the heart, we have to call it a vein. So it's taking blood away from my foot, that must mean it's going to my heart. So we have to call that a vein. If it's taking blood from my brain, that means it must be going to my heart. So we have to call it a vein. If it's taking blood from my thumb, that means it's taking blood 
away from my thumb. That means it's going toward my heart. It means we have to call it a vein. Veins are less specific. Veins are more vague, as I like to say. Remember I said the arteries are like the waitress. They have a very specific direction they have to go into a very specific location and a very specific uh, customer that has to get their food. Uh, veins are like the bus boys. Once everyone has left the restaurant, it doesn't really make a difference which tables he buses and cleans up first. Uh, all that really matters is eventually everything gets brought back to the kitchen. So veins aren't as specific. What that means in medicine then is that means we can cut out a vein if we had to, and the blood will just find another pathway back. So we can interrupt blood flow through a vein. The blood will just find another way. Also, veins aren't under high pressure because veins aren't under high pressure. If you cut a vein, puncture a vein, slice a vein, blood is going to leak out, not pump out. And veins don't have a lot of muscle in their walls at all but they do have uh, the ability to stretch a lot, which is why at any given time, most of the blood in our body is found in our veins. The veins have the ability to stretch much more, but, oh no, that's not what I wanted to do. But because <clears throat> veins have low pressure, Here's our vein, and we have blood that is going to be returning to the heart. We know that because all veins carry blood to the heart. Because the veins have low pressure, what we're going to find is that they're also going to have built-in one-way valves. So. If that pressure starts to drop too much, the, val shoot, the valves will close. And why will the valves close? Because remember, I'll put little arrows here, low pressure. We want the valves to close because this is a circular system. We want blood going in one direction. We don't want it going backwards. So in the veins, if the blood starts to, the pressure starts to go a little bit low, those valves will close up until the pressure builds up again enough to push the valves open. So what is the clinical significance to knowing this? Lots. Because if those valves fail, then blood can collect. in this vein. Causing the vein to bulge. If this happens in her legs, we call this varicose veins. You've probably heard that term before. Now, why did I say if it happens in her legs. Do men get varicose veins? They do, but not as much. 
and I'll tell you why. Estrogen. Estrogen over time weakens the valves and the lining to the veins. And of course, who has more estrogen flowing in their blood in their lifetime, uh, men or women? Yes, you guessed it, women. So because of this, women are much more prone to getting these varicose veins because those that estrogen causing this effect on the valves and on the lining of the veins that causes them to fail and causes the veins to stretch. Now, the good news is you could cut this out, especially if you get it early, you could zap it out with a laser because blood will just find another way, right? Remember, we could cut a vein out if we needed to and blood will just find another way back. But what difference does it make? if they have them there. So they're unsightly, what's the big deal? Well, the deal is that when blood stops moving, it starts clotting. So this could put the person at risk of developing clots in these veins. As blood stops moving, it triggers those clotting factors to start clumping together. So that could increase the risk of clot formation. Why else might she want to get rid of these? Well, because they might be uncomfortable and even tear and cause some bleeding. And I hear you thinking, well, where can a varicose vein tear and cause some bleeding? Uh, in the rectum and the perianal area. This is what people call hemorrhoids or piles. These occur as a result of the valves in those veins failing and the vein bulges. That's what a hemorrhoid is. It's a bulging superficial vein. All you gotta do is cut it out because remember, if you cut it out, blood will find another pathway back. But that's why we can cut them out. So why does this happen so often, especially in pregnancy? Well, because that inferior vena cava especially is pumping blood toward the heart. But, when she is increasing her intra-abdominal pressure, trying to squeeze that baby out, that inferior vena cava is getting compressed. And as that inferior vena cava gets compressed, the blood cannot continue in the same direction as well, which means it's gonna back up. It's going to create a back pressure all the way back to these little tiny veins. Now those valves are going to fail and those veins are going to swell. So can we see varicose veins in other areas? Yes. Um, we'll talk about them, I think, when we get to the gastrointestinal system. We'll talk about something called esophageal varices, which is basically varicose veins in the esophagus. But that all comes back to the fact that the veins have little muscle in their walls and veins are under low pressure. That's why you can't feel the pulse in a vein, even though you might be able to see the vein because it's so superficial. It can be superficial because the body's not concerned about those, but you won't be able to feel a pulse of blood going through those veins. And that wall of the vein does have a bluish color to it. And this is why people think that blood is blue because they're looking through skin and they can see this 
vein that has this greenish tint. And of course, you're looking through skin in a fatty layer and fat is yellow. So yellow and that blue um, wall of the vein makes a greenish color. But just because you see a house that's painted blue, you don't think the occupants inside of it are blue. So the same thing with the vein. Veins aren't clear tubes. So you're not looking at, at a, through a clear tube at blood moving through. You're looking at a tube that has a bluish colored wall. Okay. What else about veins? Low pressure, have valves. Um, they're often larger in diameter. And it's very common to find veins running right next to the arteries. And that kind of makes sense. Because if you think of coming from downtown, uh, like to the school, you go 95 south, and that takes you in one direction. But then to get back to where you started, which is what's going to happen in this circulatory system, we're going to end up back at the heart. You have a blood, you have a road in the case of 95 north that brings you right back into the downtown area. So it kind of makes sense to put these two blood vessels an artery and a vein right next to each other because they're going to be taking blood to the same area and, re and bringing back blood from that same area. So it's very common that they're going to, have to be running right alongside one another in some way. Okay, where is the... Uh, I'm not going to go into the different layers of uh, some of the muscle and such but here's what I do want you to see because this actually shows a really good uh, comparison so here's an artery and we'll look at this first this cut section of the artery the white part in the middle is the lumen that is where the blood flows then you have a lining that is the intima or the endothelium uh, that is going to be that lining that allows blood to smoothly run across it. Then you have a really thick layer of muscle that is going to relax and contract to allow for the lumen to get bigger or smaller. Now compare that to that vein. Notice the lumen of the vein is much, much bigger, but the muscle is very, very little. There's hardly any in there. Much lower pressure, and they even show the valves that are going to help maintain that unidirectional flow back to the heart, because all the veins take blood to the heart. And of course, the capillaries are the simplest. I mean, they're just a few uh, cell few layers of cell thick or even less in some areas very very thin thin walls because capillaries have very thin walls they're more prone to blood leaking out of them in other words they're more prone to damage and having blood leak out and if that happens and collects under the skin we call that a bruise now of course we have other terms for them depending upon the size. We can call it petechiae. They're very, very small little red dots that we can see in the skin, for instance, or if they're larger than that, we can call them, uh, let's see, I just lost the term, petechiae. I just lost the term completely. I'll come back to it in a minute. Because now all I can think of is echomyosis. And echomyosis is a larger bruise. Purpura. I don't know why I couldn't think of purpura. Petechiae, purpura, and echomyosis. Depending upon the size of this, these hemorrhages that occur. And one thing that you'll often see in elderly patients is uh, capillaries getting damaged much more easily. Um, you'll also notice that when people are on medications uh, that are often referred to as blood thinners, but of course we know they aren't thinning the blood, we know them as anticoagulants, 
um, they're going to have more of these areas of capillaries that are leaking blood out of them. And because of that, they're going to have more bruising underneath the skin. Sorry, I completely forgot the word purpura, the term purpura. Okay, let me show you this sort of all at once because it's much easier to see it this way. I'm going to break it down into two basic parts systemic circulation and pulmonary circulation. Pulmonary circulation is really easy. Every tube that is taking blood to the heart, let me rephrase, let me start over. Pulmonary circulation is really easy. I think it's time for a break. Pulmonary circulation is really easy. Any tube that's taking blood to the lungs, through the lungs, or from the lungs is involved in the pulmonary circulation. Any vessel, any tube taking blood to the lungs, through the lungs, and then from the lungs, all of that is considered pulmonary circulation. The tubes taking the blood to the lungs, through the lungs, and then from the lungs, returning back to the heart. That is considered pulmonary circulation, which means everything else is systemic. That's the easiest way to describe these two. Now, there is a little bit of a difference that occurs here in this part of the gastrointestinal system. Because we see, in this case, they, they've marked the hepatic portal vein. The hepatic portal vein is a collection of all of these uh, venules and small veins that have come from the intestines and the stomach. Hold on one second. Sorry about that. All of the small veins have taken blood from the intestines and the stomach, which means they've just picked up nutrients. They've just absorbed that stuff that you ate, all those nutrients that your body has just absorbed in these areas are going to go into that hepatic portal system here, the hepatic portal vein, which isn't a true vein because it does something very odd. It branches off in the liver into smaller veins. And I say that's odd because most of the time what we expect to see are capillaries to venules, venules to small veins, small veins to bigger veins, bigger veins to the vena cava. That's what we expect to see most of the time. Capillaries to venules, venules to small veins, small veins to bigger veins, bigger veins to vena cava. That's what we expect to see. Not to go from small veins to bigger vein and back into small veins again. But of course, this is happening because you just absorbed all those nutrients in the gastrointestinal system and the liver is going to figure out what to do with them. Should we store them? Should we keep them in the blood? Should we build them up? Should we break them down? What should we do with them? And then you can see that all collects again and of course then goes into the vena cava. So the hepatic portal vein is, is technically not a true vein because it doesn't follow that rule where most veins are going to go and become bigger and bigger and bigger and eventually vena cava into the right atrium. It's a little different that way. The term anastomosis is just a fancy term for a connection where it joins one tube joins another tube. So it's a good term to know, but it's very basic. An anastomosis is just a connection. Okay. I do think oh, I'm so close. All right. Well, I was hoping to get a little bit further, but that's okay.
Thanks for the good one, Ryan. I do think though, okay, so sorry for the interruption there. I'm gonna grab this giant heart, you can see here. And some things very obvious from the start, the aorta, you can always tell the aorta, the aorta is that arching part. And you can see the three branches coming off. Well, if I do it this way, you can see the three branches coming off a little bit better that way. What you cannot see are the coronary arteries, which of course would be down behind here and over on this side. So you'd have to move this part of the right atrium out of the way to be able to see that. You can see the superior vena cava coming down and you can see the inferior vena cava right here in blue. So if I open this up, if I can open, there we go. I'm gonna open this up first of all. Seeing the inside now. And it still doesn't give a good picture of it. You can see the right atrium here. The superior vena cava coming down this way, bringing blood into the right atrium. The inferior vena cava right here, bringing blood into the right atrium. And then that right atrium is going to push the blood down through this tricuspid valve. <laughs> into the, sorry, into the right ventricle here. The right ventricle is then going to push the blood up through this valve. This is the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary trunk, which you can see if I spin, spin around this way, it will split off into the right and left pulmonary arteries. This would be the left pulmonary artery. This would be the right pulmonary artery. Then blood's going to return from the left lung here and the right lung here into the left atrium, which is gonna pump that blood down through the bicuspid or mitral valve into the left ventricle which is then going to pump the blood up and out this way up into the aorta, just under 200 miles per hour. I don't know if the light is helping or not. Into that aorta, which then will pump blood out to the rest of the body. I'll put this back on. One of the things that I just see. Remember, these vessels here are the coronary arteries and the coronary veins. And here you can see that uh, left anterior uh, descending artery here. This is that dangerous one that we definitely don't want to clog. Not that we want to clog any of them, but you can see the coronary arteries and the coronary veins bring the blood back. And I definitely want you to remember the coronary arteries are the ones that are on the heart. They're bringing blood to the heart itself. Important to remember. This right here is the apex of the heart. The tip right here is the apex of the heart. And if you wanna locate the apex of the heart, go to the left clavicle, go to the center of the left clavicle, go straight down just beneath the fifth rib. And if you count down, you'll be able to find the fifth rib. And you'll find the apex of the heart right there. We say that it is on the left mid clavicular line, just beneath the fifth rib. And you'll find the tip of the apex of the heart. So good stuff to know about. The lighting definitely doesn't help me, but I think it helped a little bit seeing the heart there. Again, I realize the first time you hear this, the second time you hear this, uh, it's not gonna stick. It's not gonna make complete sense. You definitely have to review this over and over again, or at least I did.
I think most people would have to at least a couple of times. Okay, now let's go to some important vessels. Yeah, they do have them there. So we're gonna start with the aorta. Remember the aorta comes off of that left ventricle and it goes upwards first. And the reason it goes up first is because that blood that is getting shot into that aorta at just under 200 miles per hour, that blood is full of oxygen. Remember, it just came back from the lungs, so it has a bunch of oxygen. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that gets up to the head first. And you can see the aorta is going to go in an upward direction. Oops. And you can see these branches, these three branches that come off of it. The first branch is the brachiocephalic. The brachiocephalic is that very first branch off of the aorta. And you'll notice almost immediately, it has a big major branch coming off of it called the right common carotid. And then the brachiocephalic then just becomes the right subclavian. The second branch off of the aorta is the left common carotid. So why are these important, these common carotid arteries? Well, they're taking blood up to the head and of course, the brain. So that is really important. The right common carotid is a branch off the brachiocephalic, and the brachiocephalic then becomes the right subclavian. The left common carotid is just a direct connection right off of that aorta, on up to the head. And then the third branch is the left subclavian, which you can see is taking blood down the arm, for instance. So the aorta starts off going in an upward direction. It ascends first, then it arches over, the arch of the aorta. Then it descends through the thoracic cavity and it continues down to the abdominal cavity. So you have to think for a moment. The thoracic cavity is bordered inferiorly by the diaphragm. Remember that muscular structure? So in order for the aorta to go down through the thoracic cavity and into the abdominal ca cavity, there must be an opening in the diaphragm. And of course there is. So the aorta is going to continue down. You'll notice there's a couple of big branches coming off of the aorta that's gonna go into the kidneys. Those are the renal arteries. There's one on the right and one on the left. And as the aorta continues to descend, it splits off. And it splits off right in that pelvic -y area. Remember the pelvis and the bones of the pelvis? The ilium, spelled I-L-I-U-M. So this is going to become the common iliac arteries. And as the common iliac arteries continue to descend, the big major branch that comes off of this is going to be the femoral artery because it follows down along the femur. There is still a huge amount of blood and pressure going through this. If this femoral artery gets cut, blood will pump out of it and in about three minutes, about three to three minutes to three minutes and 30 seconds, somewhere in that range, the patient will lose about three liters of blood. And remember on average, we only have five liters of blood. Women have four to five, men have five to six. So on average, we have about five liters of blood. 
if three of those five leaders are lost without replacement, the patient will die. That's it. So slicing that femoral artery means the patient is going to bleed out in about three minutes unless someone intervenes and puts a tourniquet on it. I'm just gonna continue down the leg a bit because you can see the branches off of the femoral. You can see the popliteal, not surprisingly, gonna be found behind the knee. You can see the anterior tibial artery because it comes across the front of the tibia. And the per, uh, perineal artery sneaks in uh, alongside of it as well, you can see there. And the dorsal pedis artery on the top of the foot. Back up to the arms where we have that subclavian uh, well, started as a brachiocephalic, then became a right subclavian. You can see as it gets down here, it becomes the brachial artery. And that, of course, is where we are going to be looking for a pulse on infants. And that's also where we are going to uh, put our stethoscope when we are taking blood pressure. So when we put that cuff around the patient's arm, and inflate the cuff. The idea is to stop the blood flowing from here down to here. Completely stop that. Now, ideally, if you wanted to do this, you could cut the arm open and put a little tiny cuff around just the artery and then pump it up and then put the stethoscope down below it but and I don't think patients are gonna go along with that. So it's just easier to put the cuff around the entire arm, pump it up to create that tourniquet effect. So it stops the blood from flowing past that point and then start to slowly release the pressure so you can hear it as it suddenly flows through this point. That tells us how much pressure was required to push past that blockage that you created. As it continues down, you'll notice, I think it's on this side, yes. You'll notice that it becomes the radial and ulnar arteries down here. So there's a, one that runs along the radius, and there's one that runs along the ulna. And of course, the radial one is the one that's easier to feel, and you could feel that when you're taking a pulse. So I know you're thinking, well, that's all, there's a lot there, which ones? do I need to know about right now? Well, I shouldn't have to even tell you about the popliteal artery because, well, you know where the popliteal artery is gonna be found because you know popliteal means behind the knee. And the femoral artery runs right along the femur. So you definitely should know about that. That's a good place to take a pulse as well. We take the pulse on the radial artery. So you definitely should know about that one. We also take a pulse and use the stethoscope on the brachial artery. So you definitely want to know about that one. Uh, you want to know how the aorta starts out uh, ascending, going upwards, then arches over, then goes, oops, then goes down uh, through the thoracic cavity as a descending aorta or the thoracic aorta into the abdominal cavity as the abdominal aorta. And then it splits off into the common iliac arteries. And again, that makes sense because iliac is the bone there, or the ileum is the bone there. Uh, you definitely want to know the three branches that come off of that aorta, absolutely positively. The first branch, meaning the one the blood comes to first, is the brachiocephalic, which then quickly branches off into the right subclavian and that right common carotid, because that's going up to the head and to the brain. The second branch just is a direct connection, the left common carotid, and the third branch is left subclavian. So definitely some important ones. And here, again, you can see the ascending aorta, ascending, so it's going upwards. And that makes sense because uh, head and brain's up. Then you could see it arches over the aortic arch. And then you see it becomes a thoracic aorta as it descends. Going through the hiatus of the diaphragm becomes the abdominal aorta. You can see the 
two big renal arteries that branch off going off to each kidney, which makes sense because remember, if you consider the importance of the organs in the body, the three most important are the brain, the heart, and the kidneys. And then as the aorta continues down, you can see it splits off as the common iliac arteries. Um, I think that is good for now. Uh, looking at, again at the top, the aortic arch has the three branches that come off the top. The brachiocephalic is the first branch, which quickly becomes the right subclavian and the right common carotid artery. The second branch just is a straight shot as the left common carotid artery. And the third branch is the left subclavian. Oh, does it also show the vertebral artery here? No. I don't think it did. Nice shot here of the brachiocephalic uh, becoming the subclavian and the right common carotid artery. Oh, there's a vertebral artery. I knew I, should, knew I saw it somewhere. So it travels sort of somewhat anteriorly, uh, anterior laterally perhaps, and then kind of at the very base of the skull goes somewhat posteriorly. And the, the importance of that is that these are gonna meet the carotid and the vertebral arteries are sort of gonna be the main arteries bringing blood up to the brain. Notice how the common carotid artery, excuse me, the common carotid artery, notice how as it goes up, it splits right here into an external and an internal, there we are, external carotid and internal carotid artery. That should give you a clue, internal, one's going more inside, one's gonna be more outside. And right at this split, this is called a bifurcation, right at that bifurcation, there are special pressure sensing cells that will send signals, for instance, back to the heart, saying there's too much pressure going up to the head right now, or there's not enough pressure going up to the head right now. And that will be one of the areas that'll help sort of determine how the body needs to uh, change blood flow to an area. All right. And then you can see some of these branches off of the external uh, carotid. The superficial temporal artery is a place that you can feel for a pulse. I think that's about it. Notice things like the occipital artery maxillary artery. If you know the occipital bone, okay, that gives you an idea of where that one's headed. If you know where the maxilla is, gives you an idea of where that one's headed. Good stuff. Now, looking at the brain from underneath. Here we can see how the uh, internal carotid arteries, both right and left, are going to come up here along with the uh, vertebral arteries. Notice the left and right vertebral arteries that become the basilar artery. Notice how they all come up and they sort of meet in what we call the circle of Willis. And then there are branches that come off of that. And the branches that come off of that are going to go and deliver blood throughout the brain. So we have two big arteries coming up, the right and left common, uh, right and left um, internal carotid arteries. And then we have the vertebral arteries, which are gonna become the basilar artery. All of this creates almost like this roundabout where the blood comes together and then goes out and gets redistributed. So what is that gonna mean for pressure in this area? Now, as you might imagine, 
uh, there's going to be an increase of pressure in this area. I know you're thinking, well, who cares if there's an increase in pressure in that area? What does that even mean? This is what an aneurysm would look like. An aneurysm is a ballooning out of a blood vessel, specifically an artery, because aneurysms happen as a result of increased pressure. And of course, veins have low pressure, so they don't really create aneurysms. A-N-E-U-R-Y-S-M-S, -E aneurysms. Um, the problem with an aneurysm is that it is this ballooning out of an artery and that area is weak. And because it's weak, there's the potential for it to tear. And if it tears, well, remember it's under pressure, then blood is going to go in the path of least resistance and no blood is going to continue this way. And that's not good. In some cases, you'll hear about a dissecting aneurysm. Endothelium. And a dissecting aneurysm means that some of that lining has even been torn away, creating even more of a weakened area even more likely to tear. Now, how can these happen? Well, it might just be a defect in that area of the artery. It might be the result of a cholesterol plaque that maybe peeled away some of that lining. It might be the result of longstanding high blood pressure, or it might be the result of several of those things put together. And the the worst part is that in some cases, it's just a genetic defect and a person doesn't even know they have it. They don't even know they have it until it tears. And when that happens, well, you don't have much time left. So oftentimes aneurysms are found either post-mortem and discovered as the cause of death, or they are found accidentally. In other words, the, they're looking for something else and they stumble across this in the process. Now, if a person has long-standing high blood pressure with a history of, uh, we'll say sporadic compliance. In other words, do they always take their medication? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe they don't take it for six months and they start taking it again. Maybe um, they take it every other day or maybe they take it for three weeks out of the month and then they don't take it for a week. And the next month they take it for three weeks. So their blood pressure isn't really well controlled. There's, there's times where it's not. And if this person has long standing um, high blood pressure like this, the doctors are gonna know that this is a possibility, that this might exist already. And uh, the, the, using contrast, like I talked about earlier, uh, you can sometimes see some of this, but the problem is if it's at the base of the brain, like that circle of Willis is here, and then how do you fix it? Well, you can put a clip on it, and stabilize it but how do you you know get in that close to the brain and do this without making matters worse and that's kind of the trade-off that's the consideration when a doctor comes across this they have to decide 
what's the best course of action, especially in an elderly patient, because elderly patients by default are often uh, poor candidates for any surgical procedure, let alone something this invasive. So the best thing to do at that point is usually just to make sure they're maintaining a, a level blood pressure and explaining to them and family members how important it is to maintain that blood pressure. But this is also why it's important for uh, everybody who's on blood pressure medication uh, to maintain, you know, um, to comply with the directions of their physician and maintain a lower blood pressure. Because otherwise, it can lead to a ballooning out. And the most common areas are either in the circle of Willis, and there's several different areas where this can occur uh, with different percentages happening in each area, which is something that cardiologist knows off, offhand, but I do not. Um, and then of course, in the aorta, whether it's in the arch or in the thoracic or in the abdominal, you might hear of that too, in a triple A, AAA, uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm. Sometimes these just happen and the person they, the tears and the person bleeds out internally. And they might not have any signs or symptoms beforehand, or they might complain of a sudden ripping or tearing sensation or a pain in their back in some cases. Uh, and then uh, a sudden drop, a big drop in blood pressure. That's what an aneurysm is. And I know that this is mostly an anatomy and physiology class, but we have to learn some of the pathology that goes along with it. And it, it helps to understand why it happens in these areas. So when you hear of somebody having an aneurysm in their brain, I would say that it's probably not in their brain. It's probably right here so that's where they usually happen and if that tears blood's not going to go to parts of the brain that it should go which can of course lead to the patient's death so it's kind of a big deal fyi uh here's a good thing to just be aware of Large veins of the cranial cavity are called sinuses. Not to be confused with like the nasal sinuses, but uh, it's just a good thing to know because you'll hear that term from time to time. So let's look at these large veins. Well, you can see the inferior vena cava, there it is, the inferior vena cava coming up to the heart. And you can see the superior vena cava coming into the right atrium. So if you follow the pathway, remember all these veins are carrying blood to the heart. So if you follow the pathways, you can see that the blood returning from the head, neck region, blood returning from the hands, arms, shoulder regions, for the most part, are going to be going into that superior vena cava. Or I should say, for the most part, all of the vessels coming from the, primarily the head and the shoulders and the arms, primarily, um, are going to be leading to the superior vena cava. You see there's a few exceptions to that, uh, like the long thoracic, for instance. It's not marked on here, but you can see it. Oh, no, long thoracic. But I digress. So, for the most part, easiest way to think of it, all the blood that's returning from the head, returning from the hands, arms, shoulders, that's all going into the superior vena cava. I hope I said that right the first time, the superior vena cava, which means for the most part, all the blood in the body uh, is going to be returning via the inferior vena cava. Notice how the split here Instead of blood splitting off and going down, blood is coming upwards. 
to connect at that uh, those common iliac or uh, common iliac veins. Not surprisingly, we're going to have a femoral vein. Not surprisingly, we're going to have a popliteal vein. The saphenous veins, those are kind of good to know if you just know that you don't necessarily know the difference between the great and the small, but know that they are in the leg. And these are veins that are utilized when they're doing some sort of um, bypass surgery on the heart. So they'll actually remove uh, one of the saphenous veins and use that to go around a blocked artery in the heart and the carotid or the sorry coronary arteries. Okay, so let's see. When it comes to veins, which ones do I want you to know? Cephalic and basilic. So look at look here at the cephalic and basilic. Notice the cephalic is laterally located on the arm. The basilic is medially located on the arm. So if you kind of follow those down, and you see kind of where they cross over, there's some, some crossing over. Um, the reason why I would say those are good veins to know, simply because when a specimen of blood is taken for phlebotomy, typically it is from the cephalic or basilic or one of these uh, connecting veins in between. Those are usually where we're getting the blood from, the cephalic, basilic, or the connecting veins in between. Then there's a couple here. Let's see. Jugular vein, internal and external jugular veins. These are taking blood from the head, from the brain, from the head into that superior vena cava eventually. And the importance of these is that, especially with that uh, external, you can actually see it in a person's neck oftentimes. And if they have like high blood pressure, for instance, uh, you can actually see it extend and the angle that is coming down the neck even changes a bit. These are the ones that people think if they get cut in their jugular vein, they will die. Well, that's not really true. Uh, because veins are under low pressure. So if a person gets cut in their external jugular vein, all you really need to do is put pressure on it, pinch it, and stop the bleeding. The carotid arteries, the ones taking blood up to the brain, that's those are the ones that if they get cut, blood squirts out. I think those are, that's about it when it comes to the veins that I want you to know about. Well, this is a nice demonstration. Well, I think those are pretty much all the same ones. Intercostal veins. I think there were the intercostal arteries in one of the last pictures. Uh, these, of course, are going between the ribs. Remember, costo means ribs. Mm -hmm. So, here's the inferior vena cava. If there is an increase of interabdominal pressure, like she's trying to push and squeeze that baby out, 
this is getting compressed, which means blood that is trying to flow upwards cannot. So it starts to back up. And you can see how the um, veins start to head down into the pelvis there. As blood starts to back up, it's going to cause those veins to kind of bulge. And that is going to create those hemorrhoids. I think that is it as far as the veins I want you to know about. This shows a really nice um, hepatic portal system here. Remember, when you eat something, your body breaks it down into smaller parts and then smaller parts and then smaller parts, parts small enough for you to actually absorb into your cells and then into the blood. What you cannot break down, what you cannot absorb just keeps going through. So the stuff that is absorbed here is moved into this portal system that then goes into the liver. And the liver decides, what do we do with this? That's why you can see here that hepatic portal vein, not, not a true vein, because it does branch off into smaller veins again. And then you can see how it rejoins in those hepatic veins to the inferior vena cava, and then goes to the heart. But now it has had the opportunity to figure out what it wants to do. Also, a nice image that you get from this, you can see part of the pancreas here, that yellow lumpy looking gland, and you can see the other part of it, the head of the pancreas, yellow lumpy looking part right there. So you can kind of connect that together. And you can see how the tail of the pancreas kind of points over to the spleen. Here's the stomach or one organ, the stomach. And there'd be a whole bunch of small intestines in here. They're just showing sort of one loop of it. And then in here. And then the large intestines is what you're seeing on the periphery. You see the ascending colon here, which will transverse across to the descending colon which will then go to the sigmoid and the rectum. But uh, we still have the ability to absorb things, especially water and salts uh, in the large intestines as well. So it's just a good picture. Good, okay. That's just a good picture of the portal system. Fetal circulation is different. Baby's blood and mom's blood do not mix until the baby's born. And of course, that's only because the placenta is separating and some baby's blood is in the placenta and some mom's blood is in the uterus. And now there's going to be mixed, those areas are tearing apart. So of course, some of mom's blood and some of baby's blood is going to mix, but uh, while the baby's in there, the baby has its own blood that is going through the body and bringing nutrients throughout the body. The difference is it is picking up nutrients from mom. So there is an umbilical cord that is attached to the placenta and the placenta is embedded in the endometrium. And so as mom sends blood down to her uterus and nutrients to her uterus, the cells pick up those nutrients but then the baby's blood coming through the placenta and the blood vessels that are in the placenta are going to take those nutrients from the cells and bring them back to the baby. In that umbilical cord, there's three vessels. There's two umbilical arteries and one umbilical vein. The umbilical arteries are taking the blood from the baby to the placenta and the umbilical vein is taking the blood from the placenta to the baby. Now, as the baby is in the uterus, there is no reason for the baby to be breathing. The baby does not breathe while it's in the uterus. Not to mention its lungs aren't even gonna be formed completely until week 24 to 26. And then there's gonna be, they're filled with amniotic fluid. 
So how does the baby get oxygen then? If the baby's not breathing? Well, the blood coming back from mom is going to be full of oxygen. However, there are going to be some differences in that baby's heart. That baby in here as well there we go and of course the vena cava is there and another one here with a branch coming from mom there we go a connection there um there's gonna be blood coming back that is full of oxygen going into that right atrium so it doesn't have to go to the lungs so there is a hole Here, in that wall between the two atria, where the blood, much of the blood, is going to go from the right atrium dire oops, directly over into the left atrium. It's full of oxygen, so it's going to go this way and then down to the uh, left ventricle and then up and out to the aorta. So it bypasses the lungs that way. And that is called the foramen ovale. Because foramen means whole. However, I should have just kept it here. Some blood's still going to go down here and still going to get pumped up into that pulmonary trunk. However, the body says, well, we don't really need to go to the lungs. So let's create another connection called the ductus arteriosus. So that blood goes right into the aorta. And these are the two that I would definitely want you to know about um, simply because well, they're the easiest ones to start off with. And then uh, if they don't do what they're supposed to do, then there's going to be a problem. So we know that we don't have holes in our heart like that right now. We have to utilize our lungs. So where do these holes go? Well, they close up. As soon as that baby is born and takes its breath, those holes in that ductus arteriosus close up and then they start to heal over. And we can still see remnants of this. If we open up an adult, you can still see what we call the ligamentum arteriosus, which is a remnant of that ductus arteriosus. Uh, you probably can see a little indentation of the foramen ovale where it used to be. And of course, there's going to be pathology that goes along with this. If those don't close up, then that's going to create a mixing of blood. You're going to have blood that is low in oxygen mixing with blood that is high in oxygen, which is going to uh, not be what the baby is going to want. So it's going to create different problems. Anyway, so those are the sort of the differences in the baby's heart. You definitely should read about those. Pretty interesting. There are two umbilical arteries. One umbilical vein. Good. And that's where I'm going to stop. We'll be able to take a break for a lunch. Dr. Surgeon, I have a question in regards to the um, quiz that we're taking. Is it already loaded or we have to wait to? The two o'clock, you said. Two o'clock, it'll show up. Okay. If it, in fact, if it doesn't show up at two o'clock, let me know. But I put it on time at two o'clock because, uh, hold on, let me, let me get, oh, bloody hell, let me get out of here. Like I said, um, I'm hoping that we can continue until three o'clock. But I know that some people might have to leave or whatever. So I sort of gave that last hour in the event that we can. Okay, no, no questions about the ductus arteriosus, no questions about the frame and ovale. All right, good. So, we are going to move on then to uh, the physiology of the heart. 
And if you remember, I've said before, the anatomy part is usually pretty simple. Human anatomy is basically just the parts. The physiology is where it gets complicated. And here's where it's gonna get a little complicated. But remember, the heart is made of muscle, myocardium. And in order for a muscle to contract, it needs to be told to contract, which means there's probably gonna be some sort of nerve or nervous signal or action potential from a nerve involved in this. You may also remember when we talked about muscle physiology, you said that the action potential comes down uh, the nerve to the end of the neuron. That's going to activate calcium channels in the end of the neuron. Calcium is going to come into the end of the neuron, which is going to release acetylcholine across the space, the neuromuscular junction. The acetylcholine binds to receptors on the muscle fiber that allows sodium to come in, depolarizing the inside of the cell, which is then gonna cause the chain reaction of the calcium being released and then the intracellular calcium and the sliding filament theory. The heart does not require that intermediate step of acetylcholine. It can react and respond directly to the electrical stimulus which is kind of what you want. That kind of makes sense because you don't want anything to interfere with the signaling of the heart cells to contract and therefore the heart muscle to contract. So by eliminating that, uh, that little bit of intermediate uh, of acetylcholine, the job that it has to do, it's going to guarantee function. Now, when we are being created, in the uterus from these original cells, the heart, it forms early on in that first trimester. Those heart cells are going to be present and actually contracting by about 21 days. So that's pretty amazing. This brand new set of cells that is forming into what eventually become a person, by about 21 days into it, the first heart cells are actually contracting. Now, it's not even a full heart yet. But, those heart cells continue to contract, and then when the heart is formed, those cells continue to contract, and when we're born, those cells continue to contract. And they won't stop until we die. That's a long time. So they have to contract, and they have to have a, a relaxation period. And then they contract again in a relaxation period. And that relaxation period also allows for those chambers to completely fill up with blood. Because those two top chambers, the two atria, we want to fill up with blood and then pump down, straight down into the ventricles. The two ventricles, we want to fill up with blood and then pump up and out. So we want them to completely fill up. So that relaxation time that those heart cells get, although not a lot of time, but that time is important to allow for those chambers to completely fill with blood. So the next time they contract, they pump out a huge volume of blood. So in the physiology part, we're gonna to start to look at how the heart knows when to contract. So if you are ready, we are gonna get started in five, four, three, two, one, zero. Well, actually, you should be able to see my screen all right about now. There we are. Physiology of the cardiovascular system. The rate 
at which the heart pumps and the volume that is pumped out of the heart is controlled by many things throughout the body. It's something that you have to remember. Some areas of our body need more blood than other areas, depending upon what they're doing. And let's give the most obvious examples. If you are running, you're out for a jog, or you're being chased by a bear, we want to make sure those leg muscles are working well, especially with the bear example. So we're going to want those muscles to be working optimally. So we're going to want blood getting to those muscles. And of course, blood leaving those muscles, taking waste products away with them. So in times like that, we're going to want to direct more blood flow to those muscles. That's a lot different. If we are uh, sitting on the sofa and eating pizza with our significant other and enjoying some cheese fries along with them, because you can't have just pizza without cheese fries. So now we have to a lot, we have a lot of digestion to, to do. So it would make sense that we're gonna shift more blood flow to that area to make sure that stuff's getting pushed through as it's supposed to and things are being absorbed as they're supposed to. That would kind of make sense. So some just obvious examples of when we're going to have uh, blood flow at any given time sort of shifting from one area to another. And the term hemodynamics, this is just, this is just a really good term to know. And it's just a really good definition the various mechanisms that influence uh, blood getting pushed throughout our body. And the two, of course, are gonna be things like volume and resistance. But it's a, it's a good term, you know, it's a good definition to go along with it. So let me just go right to here. Um, yeah, let me go right to here. So it's nice, they give us the heart in the grays, the gray tones, because now what they're showing in red, this is not blood supply. So maybe they could have chosen a different color for this, like a neon green or purple or something, because this is not blood supply that you're seeing here. What they're demonstrating is the electrical system that is going to initiate contraction of the heart muscle. And it starts in the uh, superior and posterior aspect of the right atrium with something called the sinoatrial node, also known as the SA node also known as the pacemaker. You see, every one of us has a pacemaker already. So when you hear about someone who had to go and have surgery and they installed a pacemaker, why did they have to have a pacemaker installed? Because their original one was no longer working like it should. We all have a pacemaker of these specialized cells that will spontaneously send out an electrical signal to tell these heart muscle cells to contract. And even around the SA node, there's specialized cells that also have the ability to, we'll say, add to that. They can't really create that signal on their own, but they can help boost it a little bit. But the SA node, this is the pacemaker. This is the thing that sends out the electrical signal that says, all right, it's time to contract cells. So just consider the timeline. Meaning the signal is going to start in that top right atrium. So what cells are going to get the message to contract first? Well, the ones that are closest. The cells of the top right atrium. 
And as that signal goes down, as it descends through that right atrium and sort of curves around, those cells get the signal a split second later. And I mean a split, split, split second later. But what that means is they contract after the ones closest to where they, the signal originated. So the contraction of that right atrium occurs from the top downward because in the top, in the posterior top of where we find that SA node, those cells are gonna get the signal first and then the ones below it and then the ones below it and the ones below it, below it, below it. So the contraction is gonna start at that top first and then the ones below it, below it, below it. So the contraction is gonna go from the top pushing the blood downward into the right ventricle. But as this electrical signal originating in the uh, posterior superior aspect of the right atrium, it crosses over to the left atrium. You can see that interatrial bundle, but it crosses over and the top of the left atrium is getting that signal before the one, before the uh, cells below it and before the cells below that. So the cells that contract first are the ones at the top and then next the ones below that, then next the ones below that. So the contraction of the left atrium occurs from the top down, which causes the blood to get pushed downward into the left ventricle. Then you can see how right before this um, septum of, of the ventricles, sort of almost where the uh, interatrial septum meets the interventricular septum, there's a point where the signal all comes back together again. That is called the atrioventricular node or the AV node. Now, truth be told, there's nothing really significant about the cells there. This just happens to be where they all sort of come, the signal comes back and collects. Then there's a pause. Again, we're talking all of this is happening in a very short timeline, less than a second, but there's a pause as that signal is recollected in that AV node. And then from the AV node, it's sent down the interventricular septum. First, what's called the bundle of Hiss. then branching off into the bundle branches. Oh, there it is, I didn't see those. The bundle of Hiss, which then branches off into the right and left bundle branches as it descends the down the septum, the interventricular septum, all the way down to the apex of the heart. In which case, now you see the signal going up each side of the ventricles and what are called the Purkinje fibers, or they have here subendocardial fibers, but we call them the Purkinje fibers. So what that means is that this area down here of the heart of the ventricle gets the signal first compared to this area, compared to this area, compared to this area, compared to this area. So this area down here at the apex contracts first, followed by this area, this area, this area, this area, which means the contraction occurs from the bottom upwards, which is going to push the blood upwards. It's gonna create that directional flow and it's gonna push that blood right up into that aorta at just under 200 miles per hour. And of course, the same thing is happening in the right ventricle. This electrical current moving down that right bundle branch into the Purkinje fibers, sending the signal to tell those heart cells to contract. And it's going to pump the blood up and out into the pulmonary trunk. And then of course, to and through the lungs. So this is the electrical system of the heart. It all starts out with that pacemaker, 
that every one of us already has. The sinoatrial node. Do you need to, do you need to know the sinoatrial node? You should. But if all you did was remember that it's called the SA node, then I would say that would be sufficient. You should know what SA stands for, sinoatrial. But if you just knew it as the SA node and knew that was the pacemaker, I would say that would probably be sufficient. And the AV node, you can definitely just know as the AV node. Now, there can be some pathology that occurs along these pathways, which is going to change the way the contractions occur, but I think we are going to not go into those so much today. An EKG, also known as an ECG, electrocardiogram. The reason it has two names, EKG or ECG, is because the person who invented it was German. And in German, cardi for heart is spelled with a K. So his was called an electrocardiogram spelled with a K. So you'll still hear me refer to it as an EKG because that's how I've always learned it. Uh, but for us, uh, technically more, more correct would be an ECG, but they do mean the same thing. So what is this measuring? It's a gram, it's making a recording of something or the graphy process of recording. So what is it recording? Well, I will tell you, it is not recording contraction of the heart. It's actually recording electrical activity of the heart. And it does kind of say that in its name. And most of us are familiar with seeing something like this, whether it was a TV show or in a book or magazine or something. We have seen this pattern before, this spiked pattern. But what does it mean? Well, the peaks in, are indicating changes in electrical activity. Let's see if it has it here. You can see the time frames when these occur. This area called the PR interval. In other words, the area between the start of that first wave and then that uh, part going into that big peak is very, very short, 0.12 to 0.2 seconds. So this whole thing is happening in a very short period of time, that electrical activity. But what, does, what do all these peaks mean? And you notice they start out with a P, <clears throat> followed by a Q, an R, and an S, and then a T. Sometimes you might even see a U wave but they're often very small. And it's not completely clear as to what it's identifying. You know, some might think that it's the repolarization of the Purkinje fibers, but you know, I say, if I'm not, if, if I don't know for sure, or if, if the books don't know for sure, uh, then I like to say unknown cause or unknown reason, so. We will say that the U wave is sometimes present. It's usually very small, and we're not really sure what it means, what it's, what it's recording. Okay, so what do these other ones mean? Well, the P wave is going to correspond with depolarization. In other words, the change of that charge across the cell. We talked about depolarization a couple of times already. It's going to correspond with the depolarization of the SA node, the sinoatrial node, as well as the atria. So the P wave is demonstrating the depolarization of the SA node where all this is beginning and including the depolarization of the atria. Remember, this is just picking up electrical activity. 
you cannot see um, contraction of the heart muscle, although if you, contraction of the heart muscle would actually be right about here, right about here is where you'd actually start to see contraction. So it's not going to show up. Then you see this reverse and then sudden spike. The QRS complex, we call this. And the QRX complex, this corresponds with depolarization of the ventricles. And that kind of makes sense because there's a lot of cells. Remember, those ventricles are thick. There's a lot of cells there. And if there's a lot of cells, there's going to be a lot of electrical activity. So it makes sense that the atria, which are much thinner, don't have as much of a spike in voltage. But the, but the um, ventricles certainly do. Now here it also says that it's corresponding with atrial repolarization. In other words, the atria resetting themselves, that charge, that the change in the charge across the membrane is going back to where it was before. The reality is, yeah, it's probably happening in there. But one, it would be incredibly small to see. And two, it's going to be hidden by all of this anyway. So yeah, it's happening in there, but we're not going to worry about that. So don't worry about the atria repolarizing. Because then we get to the T wave. And the T wave is the result of the change in the electrical current of those ventricles repolarizing. In other words, resetting. Their electrical charge across the membrane is going back to how it was. So here's what I try and teach the students the first time you're learning this. One, first of all, understand all you're seeing is the electrical activity. Two, it's happening very, very quickly, like under a second. And I would, and of course, remembering the peaks are just alphabetical letters. Starting with P and then QRS, and QRS completes one complex, and then T. Then I would say, if I was gonna memorize something about what these are representing, I would start with the T wave. And the reason I would start with the T wave is because that's the only one we're gonna worry about repolarization. We're not gonna worry about the atria repolarization. But that's the one that I wanna know about because it's gonna demonstrate ventricular repolarization. In other words, resetting. And that kind of makes sense because it's at the end. So if it's at the end, you figure, yeah, things are either finishing up or they're going back to the way they were. And in this case, they're going back to the way they were. So if I memorize that the T wave is a repolarization, then I know that everything before that is going to be a depolarization. So if I was a student learning this for the very first time and I wanted to memorize this, I would start by memorizing that the T wave is a repolarization. It's resetting. Things are going back to the way they were. And that makes sense because it's at the end. So I'd memorize the T wave as a repolarization. That would remind me that everything before that has got to be a depolarization. There's just no other option. So now I know P, Q, R, S, P, and Q, R, S complex, that's all depolarization. That makes sense. Then I go back to the beginning and I think, well, where does all of this electrical activity begin in the heart? Well, I know it begins at the SA node. So the P wave must have something to do with the SA node depolarizing. I know it's depolarizing because the only one repolarizing is the T wave. So I would memorize that, yeah, okay, it's got to be a depolarization. And if it's starting, it has to have something to do with the SA node. And since the SA node is found in the atrium, the right atrium, 
then I would have to assume that it's also demonstrating electrical activity of the atria. And it is. And then of course the QRS complex has a huge spike in voltage, which means there must be a huge number of cells. And I know that that heart has those lower chambers that are thick, 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 thick with muscle cells. So that tells me what well, the QRS complex must have something to do with the ventricles. And I know it's a depolarization because the only one that's a repolarization is the T wave. So the QRS complex must have something to do with the ventricles depolarizing, and of course it does. And then as I said, you would not see a contraction. Contraction would occur somewhere right about here of the ventricles. And then the T wave is the reset, the repolarization. It's the only repolarization we're going to worry about. Please disregard this part about atrial repolarization. Just disregard it. We're only worried about this one repolarization, the T wave. And since it's at the end and the ventricles just got that huge signal to depolarize, then it must be the only thing left is that the ventricles are repolar repolarizing. So that's how I would memorize it. P, Q, R, S, T, know the order. And then know the T wave first and know that it's a repolarization, which means everything else is a depolarization. You can see how these areas are sort of mapped out with their time frames when the stuff occurs. Notice this area here, ST segment between the uh, S little uh, under peak and the, the T over peak, that time frame. I bring that up simply because you will hear people use the word STEMI, S-T-E-M-I. And people love to use words like this and not actually know what the definition means or what the, what the abbreviation means. STEMI stands for an ST elevated myocardial infarction. So that means that ST segment is not going to be flat down here. It's going to be elevated up here. ST elevated myocardial infarction. So this will show up on an EKG that this person is having a heart attack or had a heart attack, I should say. And it'll show up as an elevation in that segment. In other words, higher up. So when you hear people say STEMI, that's what they're talking about. And they commonly use that. You'll hear people throw that around a lot. STEMI. This person is getting a stress test. As it sounds, we're stressing them. We're gonna put these leads on them to get an EKG and we're gonna say, I'll get on the treadmill. Let's see what happens. Okay, I'm not gonna get into that too much. So this shows it kind of nicely here. P wave when the SA node, especially, I don't know what it says AV, the SA node uh, depolarizes. That's incorrect, that should not be AV, that should be SA node. Then the QRS complex, uh, as the ventricles 
are now getting that huge signal. Again, we're talking electrical current here to contract. So we're not seeing the contraction. All we're seeing is the electrical current telling the cells to contract. And because the ventricles are huge, there's a lot of muscle, a lot of muscle cells, meaning a lot of electrical activity, which means much bigger spike. And then of course the T wave, repolarization is occurring, those cells are resetting themselves. That's actually a pretty nice little chart there. Cardiac cycle. <clears throat> Cardiac cycle is a, is a contraction and a rest period. Contraction and a rest period. The terms are showing you here, systole and diastole. And we can just real quick, because these terms are all, the people always mispronounce these and they mispronounce them so often we've just given up. Don't even try anymore. But I like people to know what they are. The contraction part is called systole. And it is pronounced cis. And the relaxation part diastole, which is pronounced diastole. So you'll hear people say systole and diastole all day long. Uh, and like I said, we just, we don't even try to correct them anymore. So when we take someone's blood pressure, we're measuring the blood pressure of the contraction, systole, over top of the blood pressure of the relaxation, diastole. So it's systolic pressure over diastolic pressure. And remember that is measured in millimeters of mercury, MMHG. So don't be surprised when you hear people mispronounce these two. Um, You don't have to correct them, but don't be surprised when it happens. I talked about the heart sounds before, before not before, uh, before the lub dub sound. Uh, they have the lub dub sound, but I say lub dub, or you'll hear them as S1, S2. Now, the reality is, um, they're not the contraction of the heart, right? All we're hearing are the valves closing. And the lub sound, the first heart sound. Okay, we'll get to that in a second. The first heart sound is the sound of the tricuspid and bicuspid or mitral valve closing simultaneously. And the second heart sound is the sound of the pulmonary valve and the aortic valve closing simultaneously goes through the semilunar valves. So this also is a really good chart. I really like this because it's demonstrating the pressure in these vessels. And look how you can see the higher blood pressure, both systolic and diastolic uh, in the aorta. And as it goes into larger arteries, and you can see how the pressure diminishes, gets smaller. And then once it gets into the veins, there's very, very little pressure in those um, big veins like the inferior vena, uh, coming into the inferior vena cava. By the time you get into the vena cava, there's hardly any pressure at all. So it's a really nice, chart sort of demonstrating this.
Uh, you can also think of it this way. As water lines come into your house, as they're coming in from the street, those water lines are under pressure because they have to be. And they have to pump that water to your house. And as they come into your house, then you hook into those water lines and you direct the water to places like your faucet or your shower or your toilet. And when you open up those valves or open up, turn the handles, then the water comes out with some amount of force. But then the water goes into a drain and then the water leaves the house through that drain. That drain connects into another drain, which connects into a bigger drain, which collects all of that water and takes it out of your house and connects it into a sewer line. All of that is under low pressure. It's basically gravity fed. So the water coming in has to be under high pressure. By the time it gets all the way up to your sink and then you turn on the faucet, water comes out with great force. But then once it, you wash your hands, the water just drains into the sink, which drains into a pipe, which drains into a bigger pipe, which just drains into a bigger pipe. I said before, volume of blood. I don't, um, it has here many factors determine arterial pressure through their influence or arter arterial volume on arterial volume, e.g., for example, cardiac output and peripheral resistance. Well, cardiac output still falls into that category of volume. Cardiac output is which is designated CO, amount of blood that flows out of the ventricle per unit time. So it's still about volume. And remember, I said before, volume and resistance are the two things that. Um, sort of decide blood pressure. And you can read about the stroke volume and heart rate as they come together. Okay, I think. Yeah, I think I got. Uh, almost, pretty close. I think what I'll do, I think I'll stop here. I wanted to get into the, um, actually the lumen size showing resistance, but I think I'll stop here because I do want your brain kind of fresh for that. even though it's not too complicated, but I also want to take a moment out to uh, explain the quiz again. So I'll end the lecturing part right now. Ending and cut. I'm not going to edit it. All right. Stop that.